So that's Paul's burden here to show us that the promise, it is fundamental, it continues. The promise is the basis of our relationship with God, Jew or Gentile. It's the basis of our salvation. And the law as a system, it's temporary. Don't be forced to live under it. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And uh, Jonathan, great to know that we don't have to live under the law because as we've talked about previously, none of us can live up to the law standard perfectly. So what is that promise that we need then? Well, the promise that we're talking about here is actually God's covenant promise, his salvation promise that he made way back in Genesis to Abraham that great hero of the faith and father of the nation of Israel, right back at the beginning, before God had even given the law to the nation of Israel, he gave them a promise, a promise that blessing would come to the people of God, blessing would come to the world through this family of faith. And we know that that blessing comes through the great son of Abraham, even Jesus himself. And so the the promise is foundational. And, And the law, that was something that came a little bit later. But salvation never rested on the law. It's grounded in promise. It was then in the Old Testament, and it is now for those who trust in Jesus. So when the law came, that didn't replace the promise that God had made to Abraham. It was just maybe what showing us the fact that we needed that promise? Well, the law the law was given at Mount Sinai through through Moses in order partly to show the people of Israel how it was that God called them to live. It set a standard for them as a set-apart people. But as we see the history of the Old Testament unfold, we see that the people of God are unable to keep the standards of the law perfectly. And so one of the things that the law is doing, and this is Paul's focus here in the passage we're going to look at, one of the things that the law is doing is actually highlighting human need of a Savior. We can't reach God's standards on our own. The people of Israel needed to learn that. We need to learn that. And I think many of us will have an understanding of that. We simply cannot be what God calls us to be. We can't be what we want to be. Our own conscience tells us that. And so the law points us to our need of a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior who perfectly fulfills the the law's requirements in his life, but then he dies at Calvary to pay for our failure. What a great truth that is and what we're going to continue to look at today. If you can, join us in the book of Galatians. We're in chapter 3 as we begin a message called Prisoners Set Free. Here is Jonathan. Well, one of the greatest discoveries that any high school English student can ever make is the discovery of Cole's Notes. Those who have discovered these little gems will know exactly what I'm talking about here. Cole's Notes are a series of guidebooks, if you're not familiar with them, wonderfully short and concise guidebooks to key works of English literature. They're kind of a Canadian classic. Ideally, the notes are designed to serve as a supplement to a student's own careful, methodical, diligent reading of the primary text as assigned by the English teacher. But any high school English student will know that on rare occasions of unusual pressure and unavoidable extenuating circumstance, the Coles Notes can become a very effective substitute for actually reading the assigned novel. Many an English student has made it through their final exam with flying colors, having never read the novel assigned, but having instead made the very sound investment in a copy of the Coles Notes Guide. Some might call it laziness, others resourcefulness. I'll let you be the judge. This morning, we're looking together at 11 verses from Galatians chapter 3, which serve as something like the Apostle Paul's Coles Notes Guide to the Old Testament. It's not quite a summary of everything that happens in the Old Testament, cover to cover, start to finish, but it does give us the main line through as it shows us how the law of God relates to the promise of God. Earlier in Galatians chapter 3, we made the astonishing discovery that the doctrine of justification by faith, the teaching that guilty people are made right with a holy God through faith in His promises, we discovered that this doctrine was actually known to the patriarch Abraham way back at the beginning of the Bible story. 
In Genesis chapter 12, God tapped Abraham on the shoulder, or Abram as he was then, and made some amazing promises to him. He promised to bless Abram's family and to bring blessing to the world through his line. And as Abraham believed and accepted the promises of God, we're told that God credited his faith to him as righteousness. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. God declared this sinful man to be right with him because he believed his promises. Now, that great promise to Abraham and to his family provides the foundation, really, for the salvation promise of God that runs right through Scripture. The blessings that God would bring to the world through Abraham's family are the blessings of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. If the doctrine of justification by faith had been hiding from anyone throughout Bible history, it had only ever been hiding in plain sight. It was there all along. Now, that is a wonderful discovery and a wonderful realization to come to. But as we saw last time, it raises a very significant question for us, and a big one at that. What is the deal with the Old Testament law? I mean, if God was always in the business of justifying sinners by faith in His promises and not by legalistic obedience, not through religious rite and ritual, not through the law, if that was His approach all the way along, right from the beginning, well, how does the Old Testament law fit into the picture? So much of the Old Testament is made up of God's legal requirements, statutes, regulations. If that stuff wasn't actually saving anyone, what was it doing there? What was its purpose? Well, now Paul turns to work through that question for us and with us. And as he does so, he sets before us his Coles Notes summary of the Old Testament, not to save us the trouble of reading the Old Testament for ourselves, but to help us read it properly when we do read it. And it's worth saying right at the outset here that it is really important that we should be able to do that. It's important on a number of different levels. If you're here this morning as someone exploring the Christian faith, and I hope there are a number here in that position this morning thinking things through, this is an important issue for you to work through today. It's important for you to work through because you'll never actually feel comfortable becoming a follower of Jesus, becoming a Christian, if you aren't convinced that the Christian faith is actually internally coherent. After all, Christianity, it is, it is a book-based faith. We rely on the authority of the Christian scriptures. But if you can't see, as an onlooker, as someone exploring these things, if you cannot see that we Christians are reading the Bible as a coherent whole, not reading it arbitrarily, picking some bits and then ignoring others, if it looks arbitrary and inconsistent to you, I guess you'd be justified in just walking away. For each of us believers, if we can't relate the Old Testament law to the gospel, we are going to run a constant risk throughout our Christian life of applying the Old Testament and its law inappropriately to ourselves. Just the other day, a member of the congregation came up to me and said they were encountering pressure from Christian friends who thought we should be living out Jewish practices, feasts and special days, and so on. Well, what's the answer to that argument, to that pressure? Should we be living out those requirements today? Should we be abiding by the Old Testament calendar? After all, it's there in the Bible. Well, it's a question ultimately of the relationship between law and promise, law and gospel. How do those two relate? But more than all that, we need to remember that the question of how law relates to gospel is ultimately a question that relates to our salvation. It is ultimately a matter of life and death. When we as a family were gearing up to move here to Canada from the UK, one of the big issues we had to work through very, very carefully was the whole question of immigration. That's true for anyone coming to the country. We invested a lot of time, actually, over a number of months with our immigration lawyer, trying to get crystal clear on what we would say when we showed up at the Canadian border at the point of entry. We packed up all our belongings. We'd cleared our house. We'd said goodbye to friends and family back in the UK. I'd quit my old job. And having done all that, having cut all those ties, we wanted to be crystal clear that when we showed up at the border, we would know what to say. 
we would be able to explain to the border agent what was the basis upon which we should be admitted to the country, each one of us in the family. And was the lawyer 100% sure that we'd be let in? We felt that was an important question. We didn't think bringing two children out of three or one parent out of two would be sufficient in the long run. Well, Paul is working overtime here in Galatians chapter 3, making sure that we are all crystal clear on the basis of our admittance to the eternal kingdom of God. When we stand before God on the day of judgment, on what basis are we asking him to admit us into his eternal kingdom? Well, it's an important question, and I hope we all see that. So now down to business, now to the overview of the Old Testament, and in particular now to this key issue of the place and the role of the Old Testament law in the wider plans and purposes of God. That is Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter of the Truth, a message called Prisoners Set Free. It's part of a larger series called Jesus Plus Nothing, a series where we're taking a look at the book of Galatians. And if you ever miss a broadcast in the series, you can always listen online. Just come to EncounterTheTruth.org. And while you're there, I want to ask you to consider giving a gift of support. We're able to stay on the station because of your generosity. But as you give, we want to say thank you by sending you a book. It's written by Von Roberts called True Friendship, one Jonathan highly recommends. And it's our way of saying thanks for giving financially this month. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884. Stay tuned. We'll have a little more information about this book later in the broadcast. But right now, let's get back to the message. Once again, we're in the book of Galatians, chapter 3. So grab your Bible and join us there as we continue Prisoners Set Free. Here is Jonathan. So now down to business now to the overview of the Old Testament, and in particular, now to this key issue of the place and the role of the Old Testament law in the wider plans and purposes of God. There are two key lessons here on the role of the law in our passage, and the first one is this. The law does not replace the promise. The law does not replace the promise. Verse 15. Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. Just as in human relations, as in worldly courts of law, you just can't throw out a covenant that has been duly established. So it is with the covenants of God. There's no surprise there. God made a commitment to Abraham back in Genesis 12, and he reiterated it a number of times in the book of Genesis. And having made that covenant, God isn't one to forget. He isn't one to go back on his word. He hasn't forgotten his promise, verse 17. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Now, just to get our terms clear here, when Paul speaks about the law, he is talking here about the covenant that God made with his people Israel at Mount Sinai after he released them from slavery in Egypt, hundreds of years, actually, after the promise was given to Abraham. The law that God gave to Israel at that time at Sinai outlined an entire system of relating to him and living day by day as his covenant people. Within the law, it included God's permanent moral and ethical standards summed up in the Ten Commandments, standards which remain unchanged, of course, today. But it included much more besides. It included laws governing worship, hygiene, diet, civil governance, and much else beside. It was one big package, and as a whole, it made up the religious system of Israel. Now, what Paul wants us to see is this. Whatever was going on with the Sinai covenant, with the law, whatever was its positive purpose, and it did have one, it never was designed to override the promise given to Abraham. It was never designed to cancel that out. It was not going to become some alternative means of salvation. It wasn't going to replace faith. The promise made to Abraham was going to remain the basis of Abraham's salvation, of Israel's salvation, and of our salvation even today. The deal was not about to change. God wasn't about to forget what he had once said. 
Paul points out, verse 17, that it was actually 430 years before the law would be added to the promise. That's a huge time gap. The promise came before the law. And interestingly enough, the promise itself actually looks beyond the end of the law and finds fulfillment in a time when the law is going actually to be set aside. That's the point that Paul is making in his fascinating comments in verses 16 and 17. Just notice with me, verse 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. The promise given to Abraham in Genesis, first spoken in Genesis 12 and repeated a number of times in the book, that promise spoke of Abraham's seed or offspring receiving the covenant blessings of God. And Paul notices that in his Old Testament, this word seed is in the singular and not in the plural. And he's very intrigued by that. He thinks that's interesting and he thinks it's significant. Now, Paul is a good scholar and he knows full well that the singular form of that word seed can have a kind of collective meaning. It can refer to a wider group, even though it's in the singular. But his point is that the promises to Abraham were intentionally focused, explicitly focused, right from the outset on one particular offspring of Abraham, on one particular person. And there's no prize for guessing who that is. It is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He was the one who would one day come in Abraham's line to receive the promises, to fulfill the promises, and to bring the blessing of those promises to the wider world. And so Paul's point here is that the promise first spoken to Abraham is God's long-term plan of salvation. That is his long-range plan. The promise is the big fixture, and the law is actually temporary. What I mean is this, verse 17, the law introduced 430 years later, it does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. And actually, the point that Paul's going to drive home and make clear at the end of the passage in verse 25 is that the law is now no longer over us. We're set free from it. The promise is permanent. The law, the Sinai law, as a whole system for relating to God, well, it's temporary. From where we sit now, 2,000 years down the road, that may or may not come as a big surprise to us. But for many Israelites in Paul's day, this idea would have come as a massive shock to them. It would have been entirely revolutionary. Many in Paul's day within Israel thought and believed that the Sinai law was eternally in place, fixed and relevant. The Jewish historian Josephus, who lived around the time of Christ, wrote that even if the Jews should lose their wealth and their cities, and remember they were subjugated to the Romans at this time, even if they should lose all that, at least the law remains immortal. That doesn't change. That doesn't go away. The Jewish Bible commentator Philo of Alexandria, again writing at a similar time and a similar point in history, says that the law of God remains changeless for as long as the sun, moon, heavens, and the earth continue to exist. No change there. It was taken for granted within Judaism of Paul's day that the Sinai law was valid forever, was everlasting. Everything else might change and disappear, but the law is not going anywhere. And that's why, of course, Jewish missionaries were coming to this Gentile church at Galatia and saying to the Galatians, look, if you want to be right with the God of Israel, if you want to be in good standing with him, well, you've got to live under the law of God. You've got to be circumcised or else you're in an awful lot of trouble. So that's Paul's burden here. He, he's burdened to show us that the promise, it is fundamental. It continues. The promise is the basis of our relationship with God, Jew or Gentile. It's the basis of our salvation. And the law as a system, it's temporary. Don't be forced to live under it. It's an argument that engages the intellect. It's quite a tightly argued section, this little bit of chapter three. We need to do some hard work here on a Sunday morning to understand it and get our heads around it. But this is no mere academic debate for the Apostle Paul, as we find time and time again. As we've already said, this issue really boils down to a basic salvation issue. Our eternal standing before God does actually hinge on being clear about these things. Verse 18. 
For if the inheritance, the salvation blessings promised to Abraham, if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. It's an either or, law or promise. We either depend on law keeping for our salvation or we depend on the promise of God. It's either, it's either or. But in His grace, God gave it to Abraham through a promise. Paul wants us to see here this morning just the sheer kindness of God, the grace of God that in His design from the very beginning, He chose to offer the inheritance of His promises on the basis of receiving His Word through faith and not on keeping the law. For most of us here, I guess that's a very familiar truth. Perhaps it's an over-familiar truth, but I hope we'll never grow tired of it. I hope it will never grow stale for us. The vast majority of people in the world around us labor under the belief that any good thing that will ever come to them will come to them on the basis of their good works, of their moral observance, of their religious rites and rituals. But in the gospel, we have an insight, don't we? We have a discovery, a treasure that is unknown and unfathomable to so many around us. God has promised good to His people. He's promised salvation to those who believe, and He has chosen to deal with us on the basis of this liberating and glorious truth, the basis of His promise, the basis that as we receive that promise, as we receive it by faith, we're made right with Him, and all is well between us and Him. The Lord doesn't replace the promise. That was never the plan. That was never the idea. That was never the intention of God. Now, that's Paul's first point here. And based on that point alone, we might imagine that the law was actually some kind of a mistake or a little sideshow in the purposes of God, something perhaps that God tried for a little while, but actually didn't work out so well, so He's abandoned it and moved on to something else. Perhaps the law was a bit like the North America Free Trade Agreement, as you'll have seen in the news this week, something tried for a while, not much appreciated by some, and perhaps heading for the trash heap pretty quickly. Maybe it's a bit like the European Union from a British perspective. It looked like a permanent thing for a while there, a very good idea, but the people of Britain, well, they've thought better. They've decided it actually didn't work out for them, so it's quickly becoming an abandoned experiment. Is that basically what's going on with the law of God? A failed experiment, a big mistake? Well, not very likely knowing the God we trust and the God we serve. And to head off that line of thought, Paul now sets out to show us that the law does in fact have a significant purpose. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths, and we're going to continue this message next time as we continue to look at some of the lessons we can learn about the law, what it is, what it isn't, and how it amplifies the problem of sin. So I do hope you'll tune in and join us. By the way, if you ever miss a broadcast in our series, Jesus Plus Nothing, you can come to our website and listen to the series from the book of Galatians there. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. You know, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported ministry, and as you give a gift to support this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book from Von Roberts. It's called True Friendship, and Jonathan, why did you pick this book? Well, I think this book is a real little gem. It's an easy read. It's not a long book, but it's full of practical wisdom for this whole theme of, of friendship. And actually, I think in our social mediaized culture where we connect digitally and remotely with so many people, we can have tons and tons of connections, but maybe not very many friendships. And I think we're in an age actually of profound isolation on many fronts. And we human beings, we need friends. And if we're going to live the Christian life, we need friends who are going to walk shoulder to shoulder with us through the Christian life. And drawing on the wisdom of the biblical book of Proverbs, this little book, True Friendship, encourages us to think biblically about friendship. I think it will be an encouragement to you. Well, we'd love to send you a copy of this book from Von Roberts, True Friendship, for your gift of any amount. You can give online by coming to EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884. Or again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org.
Well, thanks for doing that and for listening today. I hope you'll join us again next time.